All right, here we go. Salute to Knicks Nation on this Tuesday evening. Another edition, a special edition uh, Knicks Fan TV presented by Underdog Fantasy. Go to underdogfantasy.com and use our code KFTV for an instant deposit match of up to $100. On today's show, we are four days away from uh, the opening tip of the first round between the Knicks and the uh, blank. We don't know just yet, but we are going to talk about all things Knicks tonight with our special guest returning to the show. It is our guy. It is our guy. You know what? Wait a second. Wait a second. I got my theme music. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Let me tell you something. You know, you've been on this show so many times. We 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 had to bring it in. You know, so shout out to my producers. Alan Han, Han Solo in the building. Let's go, man. Let's go. Hit that like button, hit the share button, subscribe to the channel. CP the franchise, Alan Han in here. Left side, strong side. Let's go. They're playing my music. They're playing my music right now. I love it. It's good to be here with you. And um, it's good to be here at this part of the season, right? Because yeah. who would have thought the last time we spoke that 50 wins was a reality this year? You know, I was kind of thinking, I think I remember I was saying at the beginning that 50 is possible for this group. Now, I didn't expect it to come this way because of the injuries, uh, a big, big trade midseason. But, you know, this is um, this is this is a special group. And I think it's a team that genuinely this this town has fallen in love with. Yeah. And that's that's something to start with. And as we've said all along, what they've built now is sustainable. And it's something that you can continue to build. They have a great core. And uh, let me remind some of your loyal viewers, they have a head coach. Mm. Let's make sure we all agree on that yeah. now. Because I remember the last time I was – well, one of the last times I was on here, we had it out with some of your – your uh, <laughs> viewers about the coach but can we all now agree that this team yeah. has a head coach too yeah he, even ari is, is coming around you know he's no longer the toxic Knicks oh. fan he's changed his ways oh. so oh. okay yeah. we want him over the, 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 this team right. has won everybody over man but you know <laughs> you, you talk about tibbs uh certainly on the sidelines but on the court it's number 11 jalen brunson and mm -hmm. when you know when i preview this season from what I heard, I spoke to, to Fred Katz with The Athletic, and he talked about how the organization felt like Brunson could take another step up, and he's done it. He, he has legitimately done it. You've been there day in and day out, man. I mean, what have you mm -hmm. been most impressed with in, between year two and year one with Jalen Brunson? Yeah, I would probably say that it's that step that he's taken to consistency, right? Like there are times where, you know, really good players will have the occasional big game, and then they'll have – those bad games, I can't remember his last bad game. I mean, we have to go way back to find a game where he was relatively ordinary, wasn't making shots. Like, it's just there aren't many of them. The great ones, look, everybody has a bad yeah. game. There's no one that's perfect, right? But the great ones, they, they, set, they keep them few and far between. And then th what happens also, I think, see, this year, what we started doing, we started taking for – not enough to take for granted. That's the wrong way to put it. We started to almost just expect it. Like, you know, yeah. when he hit 30, it was just, oh, yeah, yeah, he's got 30. Like, you didn't, you don't really overreact. You don't say, wow, he's got 30. It just yeah. was, oh, yeah, 30. Oh, what's he got, 30, uh, eight assists? Oh, yeah, that's about right. You know, like, that's just become common. Yeah. You expect it. And I think he's hit that level where you now just come to expect that he's going to, like, he's the given. All right, well, so you know you're getting from him. Yeah. He's a given. It's who else is going to step up. I also think something we didn't know about Jalen Brunson was the ability, and it's on the court stuff to carry the team and all that. I think what he's done culture wise here with a very humble, hardworking approach, a very selfless approach, you know, he'll always talk teammates more than he'll talk about himself. He'll have a great game. And the first thing out of his mouth is, oh, I only had four turnovers. I got to clean that up. Like those are the types of things that when you, your leader, is acting that way everybody else sort of gravitates to that kind of personality and that i think leads to what i said before with this team being such a likable team i really do think it starts with him yeah no, no question and when you when you think about the mental makeup he's tailor-made for the city 
because Mm -hmm. maybe not with the Knicks, but across sports in New York, there's always been examples of guys that it just seemed like the lights were just too bright. Like there's too much yeah, pressure him for him. Yep. This, you know, remember Randy Johnson first day in, he, he, he stiff arms the cameraman, like, you know, guys like that. And, and, and it, he, he's just brought that demeanor where the lights are just not bright. If they're not too bright for him, there's no ego. He holds himself accountable. Mm-hmm. Like you said, right. if, he, if he even has a bad game, which is few and far between, you know, the next game he bounces right back and, and he's a monster. Right. So I, I, I just feel like that has been very important almost equally to his his play on the court. I'm telling you what we always overlook about players, and we do this all the time, you know, media fans, you always have this discussion about trading for a star or trading for a player, trading for this guy, bring him in. We all play that game on paper, right? And we look at skill set and we look at stats, right, and all that stuff, and that's what we focus on. And so many times I've, I've said, and I've talked to, you know, from Donnie Walsh to, to even Leon these days, uh, and, and even in other sports as well, Mike Tannenbaum was the Jets GM. I talked to him all the time about this mm-hmm. stuff. It's different in this town, man. Definitely. Like, it's just, it's different. And when you are re- uh, recruiting, when you are scouting, when you are planning to sign a player, a, a big-name player, and bring him into town, there's an element that you have to do your homework on that not everybody does. And that element is what you're talking about. The mental makeup yeah. of what is he made of? Can he handle this here? Cause there's how many times you said it too. Randy Johnson is a great example yeah. of one, but it's only one. Yeah. How many times has a dude come in here and be like, Oh, I love the big stage. Oh, I, I, I love, always love coming in here as a, as a, as a, a, a visiting player. You know, I, I can handle it. I can handle media. I can handle, and then like within three weeks, like we walk out of a room, we just go, "This guy's not making." <laughs> he's not. It. Like he's you not just gonna, know, <laughs> like yeah, this guy's not going to. He might handle it. You know, yeah. like you just know, there's certain guys that have all the talent in the world, but they cannot handle the extra stuff that comes with playing in here. I would my whole phrase about the, the heaviest jersey in the league. Yeah, that's a real thing, and so there aren't many guys that can do it. You actually with with, with Jalen. Clearly, Rick was here. Rick understands yeah. it. He grew up in this. They're guys from Jersey, so they they already know what comes with it. And I think that certainly was to his advantage. The pedigree, the yeah. blood in the ground, right? The the Godfathers that wore the jersey that all saw him as a little kid. That stuff allowed uh, allowed him to have the toughness to handle all the stuff that might come with it, but also the humility to understand that in this town. You can't, there's a certain way you can't act. There's a certain attitude you can't have. And humility, that sells here. That works here. People will root for you yeah. that way. Just, Even more. It took Julius Randle a couple of years to figure that out too. You yep. know, but yep. Yep. Brunson had it built in. And any other star that wants to come in here better look at him and say, okay, that's how you, that's how you got to do it around here. Do you have an MVP vote? No, no, I have not had one since I worked for MSG Network. I used to have one. Mm. But because uh, when you are on the regional sports network, they won't let you vote because you're too closely tied to a team. Makes sense, and it yeah. puts you in a compromising position because yeah. let's say, you know, like I don't put Jalen in my top five, right? Let's just say I, and they don't want to put you in a situation where you feel like now I got to see this guy every day and it's uncomfortable. So, yeah, they, they I have mm. not been able to have a vote um yeah since i was a sports writer interesting so uh just combing the the, t- the twitter sphere right now it looks like 17 of the 100 mvp votes have been confirmed now a couple of your colleagues on here jj voted Jokic, Stephen a voted sga i would vote sga big perk he voted SGA, man. Next time you see Big Perk, bring the smoke to him. He's talking all this Nick stuff and doesn't put Brunson in there. Where would you put him in, in your MVP ladder, though, realistically? Yeah, I, I don't know why people are voting for SGA. Um, it's 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 Nikola Jokic or, or Luka mm. Doncic to me. Like mm. I think those are the two I'd go with. If you have fatigue with Jokic, you go to Doncic. I mean, I think Luka in the better uh, – it's the second half, so I get it. Like, you know, Jokic has been great all year. I just think what Luca has done, and by the way, can I throw in that add to the MVP ability that he took Kyrie Irving and made him like actually a functional player who's on the yeah, court and not causing yeah, any yeah. other issues and 
you know, fitting in and all that stuff. That's got to come with some type of catch there, right? <laughs> but but reality that I feel is that Luca has really played at that level all year. Mm. Um, and Dallas is, uh, to me, a dangerous team mm. in the postseason because mm. of how well they played down the stretch. But, you know, Nicole Yoke is the best player in the league, mm. and he's on the best team in the league. So I think if you want to just go by definition, you know, you give him the vote. But I'd probably sit and put all the crunch the numbers and stress until the last minute I had to put in the ballot to decide between those two guys. Where would you put Jalen in in that mix? Three. Three. So you you yeah. put him ahead of he's, Betsy? He's bull- yes. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Because because of and I do it, like I said, it, it's and it, Shea's had a great year, right? He has. And it's a young team. I understand yeah. it. But they had no adversity this year, right? Like, they had none. Um, they are really well coached. And I think that's what Dagno should win coach of the year. Very well coached, deep team. He's got, I mean, the Jalen Williams kid is t- tremendous He's talent. Star, superstar. They have a really good roster. Lou, yeah. Lou Dort protects him so he doesn't have to guard anybody. You know, there's a lot going on there that has benefited him. Now, he's a great player, great player. But name me another star in the league that has gone through what Jalen Brunson has gone through this year in New York when it comes to losing three starters. And a lot of times when that happens, you're going to get all the defensive pressure. It's easy to guard you now. Oh, we're just going to trap and we're going to make somebody else beat you. And since the Randall injury, I mean, you take away an all-star – all NBA player from another all-star, take him off the roster. And all he did was be more efficient, score more, 30 points a game he averaged yeah. for the rest of the season after the Randall injury. And his assists went up. So not all, so it wasn't like he just became a gunner right, going right. for his. He understood traps coming, doubles are coming. I've got to make sure that I find the open man that I know where the doubles are coming from. And I, and I, you know, I, I make them pay. And I feel like that's what we got out of Jalen Brunson this season, especially since that injury. So to me, he stepped his game up and 20 and 21 and 12 since the injury with yeah. Brunson in the lineup. 150 games finished second in the East. I'm sorry. All those all those things come together. There is no one by definition that has been more valuable to his team's success than Jalen Brunson. That's why I would put him in my in the top five. I would put him three, based on all that yeah, stuff. It's yeah. not who's a better talent. It's not you know it ain't about that, yeah. right? Individual season, valuable. Jalen Brunson belongs right there at number three. Certainly, he's done the most with the least. How much do you value the advanced analytics when you look at the MVP talks, the the play efficiency ratios, and uh, you know things of that nature? How, how much That's do you nice. how much stock you put into? Yeah. That? Yeah, I don't. Uh, that'll help me break a tie. Honestly, that'll yeah. help me break a tie. There's a lot that goes into this type of stuff, and and I'm big on. I, I yeah, as you know from the broadcast, mm-hmm. I use numbers a lot of times, but I don't mm-hmm. use them as the most important thing to make the point. I use them to support, support. the point. Yeah. Okay? okay. So that's why when you go to the analytics and you go to net rating, you go to things like that. Understand a lot of this stuff is subjective because. A player's defensive rating couldn't is not necessarily all oh, okay. Well, that's how good of a defender he is. Not right, true. Right, that's right. how good of a defender is when he's on the floor four, with four other guys four, on the floor. Yeah. Let's keep that in mind. So there's a lot of that stuff that have you have to also keep uh, think about. That's why I go to all right. How did he play after this adversity happened? How did mm-hmm. he play when that happened? How did he play in the clutch moments? Right, like that kind of stuff to me is what I would go to. Um, again, Nikola Jokic wins it because he leads the NBA in win shares. And now, win shares is mm-hmm. basically your impact on winning. That's the that's the analytic. Yeah. So when I would say, well, I I love the way Luca played this year. My God, since January first, he's averaging 30, 33 points a game. Like you know, I'm talking about midway point of the season, mm-hmm. he has been the most dominant scorer. But he's done everything: the triple doubles, all that stuff. And I could do that. But then I'm like, but I, I think Jokic deserves it. So now I got to break a tie. My first place, win shares. 
mm-hmm. value over replacement player. Mm-hmm. Those are to me that's Bork. Yeah, those are ones I go to more than anything else because like true shooting percentage and all that stuff. At that level, man, all these guys are they're great. all like yeah. all yeah. of them yeah. are great. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah. no, no question about it. CP's so, fans. So, the, yeah, so yeah. So yeah, you don't, like I break ties with it. I break mm-hmm. ties with analytics, but I don't necessarily start my conversation with them. My eyes tell me who's good. The, the eye test, man. CP, the franchise, Alan Hahn yeah. in the building, man. Salute to everybody in the chat. Once again, hit that thumbs up button for you boys. If you guys want to talk to Han Solo, man, call us up on the KFTV Discord. Phone lines are down for some Let's reason. Go. So call in on the Discord if you guys want to uh, to chat with uh, with Han Solo. Uh, my producer TM in the chat is saying, is the YouTube chat working? Yeah, I can, I can see people in the chat, man. If you guys in the chat can uh can see us okay in here it's okay just uh just hit the thumbs up button but i can see people uh people chatting there so uh we are all good now we we talk about brunson and his mvp prowess going through this season and at the end of the season i said dante divincenzo is a definite bona fide most improved player candidate 283 mm-hmm. threes made the only player since uh since steph Clay and Buddy Heald to shoot, to, to make 283 or more, plus 40% from three. And yet and still, he can't, he's not considered a most improved player because he did not quote-unquote meet the criteria for games played in the NBA. How does that sit with you? Yeah, I hate that. I mean, it's they had to come up with some type of a number to get players to play and not have some type of a bogus you know, this guy played 53 games, but he won this award, right? So they, mm-hmm. it's all, it's sad really to me. And that's why I go back to blaming the players. Yeah. It's sad to me that we need to create incentives to get you to play games, yeah. right? The whole yeah. idea is to play. Like, that's what it is. But, you know, unfortunately, that's that's where we are, you know, and it's not just on players. It's on, you know, teams and this whole era of believing that the less you play, the better. It doesn't make sense. Ask, you know, years and years, 70 years of basketball say otherwise. Mm. But for some reason, this is the thing. And you know what? But the Knicks did this season. Blows that out of the water. Dante played 81 games, technically, right? But mm-hmm. it, look, I don't think he was going to win it anyway. I, and and so that's that's the thing. It's like, it, it, it'd be a bigger deal to me if he was the runaway favorite. Yeah. But I don't think he would have won it this year anyway. Mm. Um, but... Who do you, who do you this, have? This sixty-five game rule had to happen. Yeah, you know, it had to happen. Who, who do you, who do you like in in uh, in MIP? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I haven't thought about that one. Mm. Um, so to say, he, I don't think I, I just I haven't heard that brought up about him all year. You know what I mean? Like, so mm-hmm. when I saw it today, I was like, oh, I never even nobody ever mentioned him to be a most improved player candidate. Mm-hmm. You know, like so mm-hmm. it didn't really hit me. So I honestly, being honest with you. I haven't really thought about it mm. where there's somebody that just, you know, stands out to me, jumps off the page to me as, oh, wow. Because, you know, I mean, again, it's not just him, Isaiah Hartenstein. I mean, yeah. what a what a jump he's made in his career. So you could do a lot of – you could play with it different ways. You know, is Derek White somebody you'd put in that category? I don't know. Um, but, it, yeah, it's sad to me that we keep talking about the 65-game thing as yeah. a negative – because it started out as this is the only way we can get you guys to play. Right. You know, right. Tyrese Halliburton, you know, people don't know this. Halliburton, you remember he had the hamstring mm-hmm, thing, right? Mm-hmm. And he, do you remember the game at the garden? This was, this was Brunson just had named all-star mm-hmm. and then Knicks yeah. made that big comeback Major. and won Major. that game against the Pacers. Halliburton didn't play in the mm-hmm. fourth quarter of that game, mm-hmm. but he played 20 minutes in that game, right? That would drive me crazy as a fan. Now, hang on a second. So you're only playing 20 minutes. You got a hamstring injury. So you you know you can't play a lot. You don't want to overextend yourself, but you want to make sure you get your sixty five games in. So you're going to play, but when it's winning time, you got to sit out the fourth quarter. So the games we have a chance to win, but you're not playing. So then don't play. Like what are you playing for then? Like yeah. it, it. That was going on throughout the year as well, but it all goes back to the same thing. Yeah, motivating guys to want to play. Yeah, it's it's certainly having some weird impacts uh, on the game, and I did not even realize that that Halliburton he he just played to meet go, the threshold. Go go back to go back and look at wow. that stretch of the season. Wow. He was playing twenty minutes a night. Wow, and he would not play in the fourth quarters of, of games because those were stress minutes. Stress minutes, uh, crazy man. Wow, but that you know, as a player, I understand it. Like 
I get it. Yeah. He does. If he sits out, remember how, what was it like? It was like 15 million or some kind of a huge Intensive, number yeah, yeah. that he would have lost mm. if he didn't hit 65 and you had to play. T- I think it was, it was like 20 minutes a game. You had to play. So what else were you going to do? He's got the hamstring injury, but he can't sit out because it's going to cost him. So right, I'll play, but you can't play high stress minutes because you cannot injure that hamstring. That'll only make it worse. You can't re-injure it. So he was just playing games just to make sure he was getting his quota. But he, that game, he didn't play in the fourth quarter. It was a close yeah, game. I remember that. I was, I I was that. right by the Pacer bench. Yeah. And I was just standing there by the Pacer bench. And I'm like, he's how are they not putting him back in the game? They yeah. got to put him back in the game. But then they didn't. Weird. So, you know, again, it all goes back to how we always try to navigate the different rules and new rules, and there's one of them. Um, but DiVincenzo, that's, it's amazing that it was like, what was it, five games? If he played like 10 seconds more here and 10 seconds more there, he could have gotten to that number. Nine seconds. You know, that, that stuff's wild. Nine seconds yeah, off. That's wild, man. CP the franchise, yeah. Alan Hahn here. Looks like the Lakers and Pelicans are tied at 95. The Pelicans come sto- storming back here. Uh, who sparked that? Because I, I was getting ready for the show. I, I didn't Zion. see it. Zion. Nice. Yeah, Zion. Nice. Zion, Zion had 20 in the first half. He has 18 in the second. He's got 38 points in this game. And he's guarding LeBron mm. as well. So Zion has turned it up. This is his first real postseason experience. Uh, and he's he's showing up on the stage right now, man. You know, Sha- he really is. So yeah, it's gonna be a great finish. Shaq always challenges him and and wanted to see that killer instinct, yep. that dog in him. And you saw it, especially that first half, man. Just taking it to LeBron. Yeah. So that that was good because I think the NBA needs it. And I, I want to see Zion really like assume that 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 role, man. LeBron's coming to his swan song, and Steph Curry's on his way out. Like, who's gonna be the guy of the mm-hmm. league? It's wide open. It's wide open. The right next now. face, yeah. The next face, we thought it was Zion yeah. you know, for many years. Like the yeah. whole idea was it was supposed to be Zion and Ja. Ja has done everything to almost just ruin his image and his career. Um, and then Zion has, you know, been sort of a disappointment. Like yeah. whether it's out of shape, uh, the carelessness, the injuries, yeah. all that stuff. But this this last quarter of the season, he's turned it up. Mm. And so we'll see now if maybe the postseason, the brighter lights and stuff. I've always believed, and it's a bit of a conspiracy theory on my part. Mm -hmm. I've always believed that he needs the big stage to play big. Mm. Like, I think, like, you know, the the bright lights and all that stuff. You ever notice when he, like, certain places, like, he's a little more lit up than he is anywhere else. So I'm wondering if maybe the playoffs and the bright lights of the playoffs kind of, you know, put a little juice in his game. It sure looks like it. Like I said, 38 points so far with still two minutes to go in this game. And it's been back and forth right now. This is a fun one. True indeed. And, you know, we, when we talk about Isaiah Hartenstein, we talk about Dante DiVincenzo, so even talk about Jalen Brunson, another, no, more mm-hmm. guys on the list of players who are having career seasons under Tom Thibodeau. I, I mean, the the impressions of Tibbs are changing. This is now year four. Again, <laughs> you've been there for all of it. I say that this is certainly mm-hmm. the best job that he's done since he's been here, but as a coach – could be the best job he's done since he took you know Nate Robinson and those guys to the playoffs. What, what do you think? Which yeah, which is amazing. I I just feel like this has been building. Like I I don't like you can't take each season as they're different. You have to see how he's taken year one, the step back in year two, the adjustment in year three, where he went okay, look, Fournier, this ain't working. Like, I know we paid him $72 million, but I can't win with this guy in my rotation. Yeah. I got to sit him. And I give credit to the front office for saying, you're the coach. Coach. Like, do what you got to do. That was – because think about how delicate of a decision that was. Because in some situations, a front office who gave a guy that much money will say, you're the coach, figure it out. Well, I got to bench him. You're not doing that to my guy. You're going to make me look bad. Right? Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. Nobody had any egos. It was, coach, if that's how you feel – make it work. And I mean, the results were obvious right yeah. out of the, right from the moment that he made that move, that Cleveland game to me turned everything around mm-hmm. last season. And so, you know, you get last year's playoffs, you get the emergence of Brunson. Um, you see them get in to finally win a playoff series. You have all that stuff happen. And then, you know, running out of gas, literally with injuries uh, against the heat. And, you come into this season with that feeling of how do they build off of that? So I feel like for Tibbs, it's always been about the next step, the next step, the next step. Developing a Deuce McBride, 
to be yeah. ready to take the minutes when they trade a beloved player like Emmanuel quickly, who had a huge role in Tom Thibodeau's rotation. Oh, yeah. And just deuce is ready. He'll be ready. And then those first to like 10 games where we were wondering, I don't know if he's ready. They might have to go get somebody. Right. You know, I don't know if he's going to do. And then Deuce finishes the season playing high confidence, shooting the ball very well. And just, you could see it. There's a guy you got to have on the floor when Brunson's not out there. So it's that kind of development. It's understanding what to do with, like I said, the Grimes thing. Mm. You know, like, think about it. Quentin Grimes is a starter. What Dante DiVincenzo was signed to be was a backup. He was supposed to come off the bench and just be another shooter off the bench. But... With Grimes uncomfortable in that role of, of catch and shoot guy, you know, just kind of space and you know find the seams and just make yourself available for kickouts. You're not going to place called for you basically. Just be available and then play defense. And Grimes couldn't figure it out. You know, really was just getting to him. He was having a bad year. They put him to the bench and they just put Dante in the starting lineup. And it was like Dante's like, oh, I know what to do. Yeah, I, I don't know exactly. Yeah. And he, Knew exactly where he was supposed to go. Why? Well, he had the experience of playing with Brunson. Yeah. So that's, you know, that's all coaching. That's worked out. And and so having players ready to play and give you what they – and I think they've done a good job with Bogdanovich in getting him to figure out what they need from him. And by the end of the year, even he, yeah. as bad as he looked at times, has started to find, okay, this is what they want me to do. I figured it out. I think that's great. And I'll give you one last thing. I know mm-hmm. I'm going long here. Mm-hmm. But no, go ahead. I'm good. The thing I said, the thing that I really believe that pushes back the whole um, criticism of Thibodeau wearing his teams down, playing them too much, they break down, everybody gets hurt and all that stuff. His, would you argue, would you say, let's agree, the final 20 games of a regular season, would you say are probably the most important? Yeah. Final 20 games, mm-hmm. right? Let's like it. That's. That's heading to the playoffs. You want to be playing your best, best, right? Yeah. And he always says that. A season is building so that you're playing your best at the end of the season when it matters most because that's going into the playoffs. Okay. So I looked it up, and it's staggering to me. In the last 20 games of his four seasons with the Knicks, the winning percentage in those 20 games, which is now after four years, is 80 games, is 675. Mm. It's 54 and 26. I mean, that's, you know, think about that. Yeah. That's a, yeah. that's 50, that's 80 games. Is a, you know, it's a season, mm-hmm. 54 and 26, mm-hmm. 675 winning percentage when it matters most. So our teams break, are his teams breaking down under all the pressure and, and intensity and minutes and all that stuff? Or are they getting better when it matters most? Are they winning the most when it matters most? They're winning games late in the year. That matters. Yeah. And, so and, I think that says everything you need to know about the coach. He's the best coach they've had. Yeah. And I love Mike Woodson. He's the best coach they've had since Jeff Van Gunn. No question. And, and that's why, you know, I've gotten this question over and over again about them. Should it, should they have taken the, the, the foot off the gas in the final game against the Bulls? Uh, you know, Milwaukee <laughs> was kind of positioning themselves. Cavs were positioning themselves. <laughs> I said, no, I'm, I'm, I'm with the Coughlin Thibodeau play it play you you want that momentum going into the postseason because you want to be playing your best i like the fact that billy donovan had the bulls you know ready to play yeah they had nothing to yeah. play for but i felt i felt yeah. like you know he wanted to give his team some momentum going into the play and i, I didn't mind that at all donovan oh, by the way did what he did because he he there was a possibility that the east games would be tonight mm. like they didn't know yet because so so philadelphia the flyers were playing tonight in philadelphia so okay. the arena wasn't available but if Philadelphia had moved to six, then the East games would have been tonight from what I understood. So in his mind, I might be playing on Tuesday night. It's mm. Sunday. He gave them Friday where he, he sat some of his guys on in his Friday game. He treated Sunday against the Knicks like a regular game. He wanted his team because he knew the Knicks needed the game or wanted the game. Yeah. He wanted his team to start ramping it up. So he thought, Let's let's play this one out. Like let's go toe to toe with them and see, you know, if we can start getting ourselves in playoff mode now. So I, I really respected what Donovan did. That's what we were talking um before the game, and that was the game plan. Now we're, we're gonna treat this like a real game. We wanna be ready because two days from now we're gonna we could be playing for for our lives. So that's why they did that. 
And the Knicks, the Knicks played that thing out. But I'll tell you what, though. See, I, I, around the garden, I was getting people looking at me going, should we be winning this game? Yeah. Like, yeah. do you really want to win this game? Should it be better to play the Pacers? Would you rather? And I'm with you. Strategy is important. Like the Lakers, it's right now 104-102, under a minute to go. Lakers mm-hmm. have a lead. The Lakers win this game. Your prize is to play the Denver Nuggets. Are you sure? <laughs> you haven't beaten them in nine games. Right. Are right. you sure you want this game? So, you know, I get that anxiety from Nick fans about playing Philly with Embiid, playing yeah, yeah. Miami, which is, you know, it's always a dogfight versus a Pacers team that has no playoff experience and doesn't really defend, you know, which one would you rather have? Yeah. I don't know. I'd rather have a 50 win season and I'd rather be going into the postseason playing my best. It's, it's just, you know, we'll, we'll revisit this conversation if the Knicks yeah. don't get out of the first round. I know we will. Yeah. CB the franchise. Oh, we got to talk about that. CB the franchise, Alan Hahn on the ones and twos. So to everybody in the chat, once again, hit that thumbs up button for you boys. Uh, we are talking Knicks. Knicks playoff Q&A. If you guys want to talk to Han Solo, call us up on the KFTV Discord. Discord only because the phones are down. And what it seems like, seems like YouTube is kind of down right now. This video is still going our show's still going live, but it seems like uh, I'm just searching across Twitter. Seems like there's a little bit of a glitch in the matrix right now. So uh, just oh, hang no. tight. Okay. Yeah, hang, hang tight. But it seems like we, we are still on all green. So good to go there. Now, you have, obviously, you have Philly. You have the Heat. Mm-hmm. Who do you want? Who do you not want? What are you, th- what are you thinking about? Yeah, I, I said I talked about this on my show um, yesterday when you know we knew this was going to be the possibility, and I kind of broke it down this way. And by no means is this like a perfect formula, but for me, this is how I'm looking at it. Mm-hmm. Philadelphia is the opponent that I probably would prefer, only mm-hmm. because you know confidence comes from demonstrated performance, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. The one thing I know is that the Knicks went into Philadelphia and won both games. Mm-hmm. They've already won that. The Knicks went into Philadelphia and won by 30 when Embiid was on the floor. Mm-hmm. Like he was in the game and they still smoked him. Um, I have three guys that are my main players that that's home to them. They own that building when they played at Villanova. You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. there's a comfort level that they have walking in that place. That's like, yeah. So there's that. So I feel like it's a little less of a house of horrors kind of feeling when you got to play on the road. That's one. Two, the last time I saw Joel Embiid play in a game, he landed funny, Mm. started limping, left the game. Mm. Now, he did come back, and they did say that if he had to, he would have played Sunday. They just were resting him for precautions and all that stuff, but he'll be ready to go tomorrow night against the Heat. Got it. But all I needed to see was that. All right, so he tweaked it. That means it ain't right. You know what I mean? Like, he did just have surgery, you know, yeah. a, a, a month or two ago. And we already know about him that conditioning has never been his best friend. You know, like right. conditioning has always been question mark. And so he does wear down. He does get tired. Now, he's a great player who's going to score 30 and 12 with his eyes closed. Right. We know this. Mm-hmm. But I also know that when he's not on the floor, they're not nearly as good a team. So I got four big bodies I can throw at. I can just keep hitting them and pounding them and pounding. I know that. And I wait and see if can he handle that pounding as we get deeper into the series. Yeah. And so I'm looking at it from that lens of the comfort ability on the road and their star who that little tweak told me, okay, and a huge brace, no, nah, mm. Let's see if he can do on one leg what he had Mill do on two, which is have great playoff yeah. success. That's where I'm going. Now, the fear is Nick Nurse, junk defenses, yeah. really smart like that. Kelly Oubre throwing him at Brunson, you know, that kind of stuff. Maxi going downhill super fast. They, they have a hard time keeping downhill guards in front of them. You know, this is right. a nightmare right. matchup. It still is. But if you're, if you're comparing them, I want nothing to do with Eric Spolster. I want nothing to do with Bam Adebayo and his legs stepping on people and kicking people and all those things that we know somebody's going to get hurt, right? That's the stuff that makes me crazy. And just the uncertainty, Tyler Hero's back. You didn't see him last year. There's just so much going on with the heat in that series that would concern me more than anything. 
that I prefer to just not see them at all. And if I can just one more thing, mm-hmm. I would rather Miami play the Celtics. Because if I do see Boston later, I know there's going to be a bite taken out of them in that series that they play against Miami. So that's that's that, that's how I broke it down. I'm convincing myself in my head that's the way I want to see yeah, it. Yeah, so. not, not a bad way to look at it, especially when you think about Miami uh, potentially seeing Boston and, and Boston maybe getting a little stage fright there. So you, you just never know. But with Philly... yeah. You know, Philly playing their best, Miami not playing their best. They're dealing with the injury bug. No Terry Rozier tomorrow in this playing game. You have mm-hmm. uh, Duncan That's Robinson big. trying to recover there. So, you know, Miami, they're still trying to find themselves. Is it is it just the reputation that we're nervous of? Or are they, you know, are they really going to be those guys? I'm, I'm just not so sure. At least with Philly. You're right. You know, you have the dynamic duo there, the MVP and Joel Embiid. I think that's tougher. I think also they can match the Knicks in terms of the physicality, the size, uh, the depth. You know, they, they, they're they bringing in campaign off the bench. Buddy Heald, erratic mm-hmm. shooter, but a good three-point shooter when he's on. Kelly Oubre is playing some good ball. But just like you said, the coaching factor. That's nothing against Doc Rivers, but Nick Nurse, you have a championship head coach. A coach that may be willing to take a bit more risk, uh, make a, more adjustments, right? That's always Doc Rivers' uh, knock. And so that's why I think Philly could be the tougher matchup here just by the way both teams are playing and the extra coaching advantage that Philly has as opposed to last year. Yeah, I, I completely agree with all that. Right. Like I said, my theory isn't perfect. It's yeah. just the, the best I could come up with when you're asking, you know, and I asked myself as I did on my show. All right, so who am I picking? Who would I rather? You got to have somebody. Yeah. So I convince myself this is the better way to go. But you're 100 percent right because they are feeling good. They are playing with confidence. This is a team that does believe in itself. I, I also, you know, have to mention Kyle Lowry always finds a way to always. mess up things with the Knicks all the time. Always. He almost lives for it, right? He lives for it. So that's of course, you know, something that I have to think about. Um, but I also. And I agree with you about Miami. We sometimes make them a monster that they're really not. Sometimes it's like their reputation precedes them and they can get in your head, even though like Jimmy Butler hasn't played well. Yeah. But we just create this scary, like, oh my God, it's Jimmy Butler. Oh, you know what? He's going to have a 20 point third quarter and all of a sudden things are going to go crazy. Like Mm -hmm. we, we create these monsters out of them because they have earned that reputation and I just look at it as I would rather not get into a slugfest in the first round. Yeah. I'd rather not. Like, sure. I just don't want to see them. I'd rather Boston deal with that because Boston has been soft for the past month. Yeah. Let them have to sharpen their iron against that team and see if it takes a little piece of them. That's what yeah. I'm looking at. That's why I'm being selfish about it. But I, like I said, there's no way that I think it's a cakewalk. The yeah. East is so... There's so much parity in the East that there's not a single series that you would be like easy winner. Yeah, like Boston yeah. is the one team that is the easy pick. They'll win that series, but everybody else, Toss it's up. a push. Yeah, anybody can win any of these series in the first round, and so that's what's going to make it so fascinating. Well, let's say it is Philly uh, on Saturday, and uh, what, what time do you think this game is even going to be, man? I, I I got watch parties to plan. I got to be somewhere. I got to get to the barbershop. What time <laughs> is this game going to be? You got Cavs in Orlando. You have Minnesota Phoenix. Yeah. What, what do you think they're slotting this game? Yeah, I gotta feel like it's it's either three thirty or or eight o'clock, right? Mm. It's got it, it, like some people whispering like, oh, it could be a one o'clock if the Rangers playoff game is is on Saturday. But mm-hmm. I heard Rangers might be Sunday. Okay. So if that's the case, then, you know, it, it, there's no way you want to put a, a, a Knicks-Philly, no Knicks-Heat series at, at 1 o'clock on a Saturday. You want that to be more in a primetime slot. So I'm guess I, you know, I'd have to think that it's either the 3.30 or the 8 o'clock, you mm. know, something along those lines. Yeah. And then maybe like the, the, the Suns, you know, you put Kevin Durant at 6. You know, that that's the best I can do um, to guess. But I'm obviously just – Speaking out of turn, just completely guessing. If if it is Philly, uh, like let's talk matchups here. How do you how do you see who's guarding Maxi? Where and where do you put Brunson? Yeah, I would think I think you're probably going to throw a lot of Divincenzo and OG kind of like mix and match, right? On Maxi to slow down, 
The bigs are going to be very critical in the pick and roll stuff because yeah. a lot of it's going to be pick and pop. It's not going to be at the roll. So the drop coverage, you got to be real careful there. You know, Joel can shoot threes. Mm. They struggle against bigs who shoot threes. You just saw what Vucevic did. Yeah, yeah. So they do really have a hard time with that at KP. That's why Porzingis, you know, shreds the Knicks these days because that pick and pop, the, the big is dropping because yeah, he's yeah. got to seize the screen. You got to drop so that the guard can recover. Yeah. And that's so you don't get beat on the drive. And then it's just that simple. Yeah. And then it's yeah. just that simple little pocket pass for an open three. And that's what Embiid's going to want to do is shoot threes. He's not going to want to trade paint, you know, down down under the basket. So um, that's your biggest concern. So, yeah, you're going to have to have some focus on that. And that's going to be a lot of OG and a lot of DiVincenzo, and probably some Josh Hart at times. I mean, you know, Deuce will be on them. They'll, they're going to throw a lot of guys to try to slow that down. But yeah. the only way to slow that down is you got to make your shots. Right. I think, a, I think a, a, you know, a low percentage Nick shooting could be disastrous. They've got to make shots, especially their threes. Um, otherwise, you're feeding right into what Philly wants yeah. to do and what Nick Nurse wants to do, which is go back to those games against the Raptors in the you know two yeah. years. I'm telling you, man, you were just those Siakam as a blur, you know, a, a Bruchot, like they just had guys that just kept going downhill on you because you miss a shot and they're gone. Um, Nick Nurse going to want to speed them up. And mm. uh, and not let the Nick defense get set. So, mm. you know that matchup with Maxi is going to be critical, yeah. and they're going to put tons of tons of people at him. Uh, you, you spoke about their their ability to make shots, and to me, that's going to be their biggest weakness going into the postseason. Just in terms, not not in saying that they're not going to make their shots because when they're on, they can be on. When you look at Divincenzo and Brunson oh, yeah. and McBride and even Bogdanovich yep. and Oji, they can be on fire. Mm-hmm. But my concern is even in the Bulls game, we saw this at, at Spurts where they almost get too shot happy. And you can see the limitations that they have in not having enough guys that can get to the basket, that can draw contact. We're going to miss Julius. You know, that can get oh, yeah. high percentage, easy shots. And that is, to me, where a guy like a heart becomes vital for this team because mm-hmm. I don't see these these teams guarding him. You know, they're going to be crowding the paint, sagging off of him. So what is he going to do in those half-court sets? How is he going to maintain his aggressiveness try to bend the defense in a way that he can either get himself a high percentage shot or being able to spray it out to maybe OG or DiVincenzo or McBride, whoever's out there on the wings. Yeah, they're, they're literally not going to guard him. I've, I've seen games where the opponent like ignores Josh Hart, which is why right. he gets a lot of the things that he's getting because, you know, he'll slash. He'll cut, like his motor is what helps because he's yeah. not a guy – like, you know, there's some players that if they're not involved in the offense, they stand in the perimeter with their hands on their hips. You know, that's what they do. They just stand there. Right. Like, they aren't playing because, oh, I'm not involved. Josh Hart doesn't do that. He just moves. He tries to find places to go. He gets involved just by his motion, mm-hmm. and the ball finds him because the old saying goes, the ball finds energy. So I think that's that's a very important thing. I also think transition with Josh Hart's going to be, be important yeah. because you want to get it and go, and he's so good at just knifing through and, getting those quick buckets that can change momentum in a game because of how fast he scores. Uh, you know, it, it, it's all those things. But, you know, I, I continue to say it, it sounds so cliche. It's about making shots, mm-hmm. right? But it is. It, it simply is. It's, it's shot making is so important in, in, in playoff basketball, but especially against a team that is coached by Nick Nurse because he is going to be so quick about getting his athletes out. Uh, you know, Ubre does the same Ubre, thing. He can yeah. get some momentum buckets as well with a couple of dunks and starts feeling good. Yeah, um, good about himself. But in the end, it's going to be how much they can free up Brunson to make sure that he can still get into some one on ones where he is one of the most dangerous scorers in the game today. All right, once again, CP the franchise, Alan Hahn talking Knicks playoffs. We're going to get to the caller segment in just a bit. We are just talking hypotheticals here. I'm, I'm leaning towards Philly uh, just because they are the home team in this playing tournament. And then, you know, Miami kind of being a bit undermanned and, and shorthanded. But we'll, we'll see how it goes. Both teams getting ready to tip off at 7 p.m. tomorrow. So we'll, so we'll see uh, just who the Knicks will be hosting on Saturday. Close to the in the second half and 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 going through to the end of the season, I felt like we saw a lot more connectivity between Brunson and iHeart. When I look at this potential Embiid matchup and the Knicks' ability to pull him away from the basket, you know you don't want him out there as a, as a rim threat. What do you think about those two being able to play off of each other 
and, you know, kind of not neutralizing Embiid because he doesn't really have weaknesses outside of his durability and conditioning, but to, to pull him away so that you have more opportunities to find cutters, to find your wing shooters, and also to get Brunson going maybe off of, you know, some dribble handoff, things of that nature. Yeah, I actually, you know, it sounds crazy. Uh, I want to get him involved in playing one-on-one defense. I want his feet moving. Mm. I want to get him tired. Like, I want to wear him out, mm. you know? So I want to I want to make him have to be active and don't let him be able to just play in space. Like, you know, you love Mitchell Robinson, but, you know, Mitch isn't a, isn't a threat mm. offensively. Like, he's not going to do anything with the basketball. He's not going to force a switch. He's, you know, he, he's more of the guy that's going to be a great offensive rebounder and, in the dunk spot for a lob that's fine but against Embiid I need him to be active I got to keep him working a lot of high screen roll as you mentioned with Hartenstein who can pass he can make that floater if you're going to drop off I mean he's really turned that floater into something special when in the pick and roll yeah. with either Brunson or DiVincenzo when the when when he when the big drops and goes to guard or goes to help on the guard Hardenstein just fills that spot. Sometimes even Josh Hart will flash in middle of the paint, wide open, little hook, little little uh, floater. So those are the things that if I'm forcing Embiid to stay nimble, help retreat, now he's bouncing around on those legs. Like I'm sorry, I if I if he's standing still on defense at any moment, I'm not doing my job. Not doing the job. I need that guy moving so he's wearing down, so that he's grabbing his shorts and he's hunched over and he's dripping mm-hmm. sweat. I need him to be like that, it, it, so he's miserable. That's what I need to do. You got to keep testing him. You got to keep making him work. So Hartenstein might be the biggest X factor in this series, mm. and it's not even on the defensive end. I think it's more what he can do offensively, not just scoring wise, but all the little things he can do to occupy MB to a point where he's grabbing his jersey, needing to get out of the game because he's not at the conditioning level he needs to be at for playoff basketball. Bench rotation, McBride for me, lock. I think Bogdanovich is a lock. Where else do you think that goes? It. Is, it, is it Precious maybe or, it. or depending Mitch. on foul trouble? Yeah, Mitch. Mitch, 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 Mitch. And, Pre- Mitch yeah. and Precious, yeah. Like yeah. just depending on situation foul. Like I said, like Precious might be uh, also, even though he's small, like as far as relatively to MB, yeah. his activity, his ability to play on the perimeter, like that stuff is a better matchup, is a more important type type thing so you know in, the, in a series like that against philly you'd probably go eight um and the ninth would be you know including precious in there but you're right it's mcbride and bogdanovich um just to give brunson a, a he can't play 48 right yeah, so you got to yeah. give him a little break yeah. but i could see minutes with bogdanovich and brunson on the floor together it's worked it's which worked i saw tom do that in milwaukee and it looked yeah, really good it looks so yeah that but you know how it is. It's it's going to be tight rotation, man. Yeah. Like, this is not one of those, you know, the minutes police, they need to go away in the postseason. <laughs> like, yeah. everybody plays a ton. Full steam. Like, let's not, let's not start counting minutes and worrying about, like, I love the helicopter parents that we have as fans <laughs> in the NBA these days who are just, you know, all my, like, the, the baseball fan, I, I don't know. You know, a pitcher reaches like 80 pitches. Our, our baseball fan, oh, you got to get him out. Yeah, oh, my yeah. God, he's at 80 pitches. Oh, my God. No, no. Yeah. When, when a pitcher is is humming along, he's at 80 pitches, great. Keep going. Like, let's yeah. keep him in there. Like, I, I'm, it's the only sport I know where they talk about, like, how much he's playing too much. Yeah. Imagine that, playing too much. Oh, my Players God, he's play. playing too much. Why is he playing so much? But, he's playing great. That's why he's playing so much. Players want to yeah. play, man. I had to get that out. Uh, of course. I, I, I had to get I've, that out. I've liked the way that in these last few games kind of seems like strategically they're trying to protect Bogdanovich by putting him out there with McBride and OG, sometimes Mitch. Oh, yeah. The Dante. Oh, yeah. I think that's going to be key, especially in the playoffs, because he, he's going to be a marked man every oh, time they're he's gonna out be- there. Oh my God, you're so right. Like you know, it's like in the NFL. I, I had a I had a Super Bowl winning defensive lineman tell me that a lot of times you will against certain opponents, you'll look at an offensive line and go, "Who's the fish?" Mm. And then all right, he, that guy he sucks. All right, so mm. we all take turns one on ones against that guy, so we can all get a sack, right? So in the NBA, I've always I've used that, and now I watch NBA games and I'm like, all right, who's the fish? How do they find them? And it's amazing to me how a bad defender against good teams gets found quickly quick. And you're like, switch, switch, boom. Whoa. Yep. How did he get on Steph Curry? 
because Steve Kerr knows <laughs> well, we got to get that guy over and let's get the switch. And now Steph Curry is going to just eat this guy a lot. And for Bogdanovich, unfortunately, that's, you know, that's happened to him. It's happened to Evan Fournier yeah. as well. So yeah, they've got to have guys out there that can help him and, you know, protect him as much as possible, but you know, it's coming and you know, it's going to happen. True. It's a matter of surviving those minutes. We're going to load the callers up on the discord, but before we kick things off, so it's everybody in the chat. Once again, hit that thumbs up on free boy CP and solo on the ones and twos Knicks playoff Q and a and Knicks nation. I have a big, big surprise for you. As we talk about game one, we are four days away from game one at MSG and my friends at underdog fantasy and yours truly CP, the franchise are sending you to the garden for game one, Knicks against, we'll see who it is, but we're giving you guys two tickets to game one, man. All you have to do, go to Underdog Fantasy, use our code KFTV to sign up, and the winner will be announced on a special edition of Knicks Fan TV this Friday. So once again, we are giving away two tickets to game one. This is going to be the hottest ticket in the city. I know the Rangers are playing as well, but mm-hmm. you know it is the Knicks town for right now. Mm-hmm. Hottest ticket in the city, man. Two tickets. CP the Fantasy Underdog Fantasy. Go to underdogfantasy.com or use our link in the video description and sign up. And uh, we'll, we'll see who, uh, who see who gets the tickets. Good luck. And uh, may the best man win. All right. To the Discord we go. We got to start it off with our guy, Ari. Ari from Manhattan. How you feeling, man? Hey, what's up, CP? We meet again, Alan. How are you? <laughs> I'm great. Um, I'm great. You you uh you come around on the coach. Come around, man. Come and around. By the way, yeah. Uh, so little breaking um, news. Little breaking news was, here, fellas. Hang on, Art. Uh, Saturday, it'll be a 6 p.m. tip off. Oh, that's what I thought. Oh, nice. 6 p.m. Yeah. Ma- magic. Yeah, the NBA just put it out. The Magic yeah. and the Cavs are the one o'clock game. Then it's Suns Timberwolves at 3:30. Figured. Then you'll have the East seven seed versus the Knicks at six, and then Lakers Nuggets Denver is the eight thirty game, and that makes sense. Put LeBron at eight thirty. Yeah, I get yeah. it. I get it. And the defending champs. Yeah. All right. But the Knicks are getting the six o'clock instead of the three thirty, um, which is which is interesting choice. Yeah. But I'll take six o'clock on the Saturday. And- yeah. Rather than the middle of the day. So there you go. Nobody wants to watch Suns and Timberwolves on a Saturday. You you gotta put them you could even flex magic cash. Put that on some other channel. You know. Well I mean I can't believe ESPN's taking that game. To me, put that on NBA TV. I mean you can can we put them on true TV? Can we put them on that? I mean, that series might be it might as well. Like seriously, that that series is gonna be a rumor. Oh my goodness. Who the hell is who is tapping into that, man? Yeah, all of them are on ESPN, so the Nick game will be on ESPN. There we go. Uh, we'll have – I know they said MSG, whether it's exclusive or not, which I don't know if it will be, but mm-hmm. we'll have pre and post, though, for sure, on MSG. I do know that. Okay. But the 8.30 Laker Nuggets game is an ABC vehicle. So nice. there you go. See, breaking news on your show there. CPM. See, uh, uh, breaking news. Breaking news. Courtesy of Han Solo, man. Appreciate there it. There you go, baby. Appreciate it. TM, let, TM right. let's clip that up and put that out there on uh, on Twitter, at Alan Han. 6 p.m. start time. There we go. All right, Ari, let's go. Perfect. 6 p.m. is great. So, um, Alan, first I want to um, say that uh, uh, you guys are doing really well there. MSG and the Knicks, uh, they're making us proud. They're overachieving this year. Um, I'm a very rational guy. So, um, at the time we had that call, I had every right to feel the way I did. Now I feel a lot better. So, salute to you and the Knicks. Now it's winning time. So, I have a couple questions for you, all right? The first one is regarding – I had a couple of questions. You already answered the Josh Hart thing, but uh, two quick questions. The first one is with Tibbs, right? Like, so I'll give Tibbs credit. He's a great regular season coach. He gets his players to play hard every night. He gets them to buy in, and he's very well prepared. People will say that the disadvantages of Tom Thibodeau are that he's very stubborn and he doesn't make adjustments. And we know in the playoffs, uh, that is what you have to do. You have to make adjustments. Am I going to have to watch this guy? double team Jimmy Butler like he's 2006 Kobe for six games in a row or do you think he has it within him uh to make an adjustment and you know perhaps do something different and play that chess match whether it's with Nick Nurse or Spolstra that's my first question and then my second question um is kind of tied into that 
Um, obviously, you said we're keep on building, and so far we are keeping on building. Um, so I like the vision, uh, but we made it to the second round uh, last year. So if we do, um, unfortunately, if, if that was the case and we were to get it bounced out in the first round, although I have them winning the first round, if they do get bounced out in the first round, um, is Tom Thibodeau, in your opinion, going to get extended or is just going to blame it on um, not having Julius Randle and um, go from there? So um, basically, can Tibbs make an adjustment and is uh, – what are the expectations for him come extension okay. um, after if, if for whatever reason he loses in the first round? Appreciate um, the call, man. But appreciate appreciate you guys. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank, thank you. All right. I, I, I think he's – I think the extension is well-earned at lock. this point. He's I, a lock. I, to, to feel like everything that he has done with this franchise and the health of the franchise, he and, and again, the front office too, Leon Rose, I mean, all of them have certainly earned more time here because yeah. name me another – this is four years and I know again year two did not go well and they had to adjust and but they did quickly right they did and they were able to continue to build and develop players and all that stuff and there's still some work to be done this summer that could get real interesting yeah. with what they do or what they could do keep an eye on that with all those draft picks but so I, I don't I don't think it's a question that the coach gets is going to continue to stay here and continue to coach here he wants to and I think he's earned it he and the staff um, as far as the adjustments things go, you know, I wish I had examples for you throughout the season of adjustments, but if you've ever watched the Knicks, you know, play to play is one thing. Half to half is really where you see it. Mm. First half things go a certain way and you kind of like look going, wow, they can't solve that. They can't figure that out. They can't, then they come out in the third quarter and it's like, they're a completely different team. Mm. That's an adjustment. Mm. Like, you know, in-game adjustments, aren't as easy to make when you, you know, this isn't, you know, the white shadow where, you know, coach Reeves pulls out the, the chalkboard and he's just doing an X and an O and drawing arrow. Like is white shadow too old of a reference, by the way, CP? Like I have no idea what that is. Time? No clue. The white shadow. That, that might've been oh, before my time, man. Uh, white I'm, shadow I'm a young was, whippersnapper, was man. a basketball themed, uh, I don't know if it was a sitcom, but it was a TV show mm. in the seventies. Okay. And it was a coach who was like a former NBA player who took all over this high school team in LA. And it was all these different characters that were on the team. And it was like, a, people loved it. It's called the mm. white shadow. Okay. You, you got to check it out. It's awesome. Right. But anyway, it, it just basically what I'm saying is you go back in time and you're like coaching, like it's, you know, like, like it's old school. You, it's harder to make those type of adjustments in game when it comes to like a scheme that is clearly, okay, this is got, we got to, we got to adjust this. We got to change this. Halftime is when you see it, and then halftime is when that adjustment happens, right? But I also think there is, though, a – you can say stubbornness. It's it's like this belief, like, all right, there's one thing that we've got to stay on, and that is we're going to always do this to that player, right? Mm -hmm. And if it fails, it fails. You know, sometimes the play – you tip your cap to the player. So, you know, this whole thing with adjustments, I, I kind of laugh at sometimes with fans, and it's, I'm not trying to be disrespectful. Mm -hmm. It's more or less like fans talk like they know more than a coach who has won coach of the year twice and has been coaching in the NBA for 30 years. And you're, mm -hmm. you are watching the game, and you're acting like you know way more than he does. When you don't know all the variables about what's going on behind the scenes, what's happening with players, what do you know and know about what I can do and can't do with this player? what I don't want to give away early in a series. Yeah. Little yeah. things like that, that strategies that, you know, I, I love passion from fans, but sometimes can you just like dial it back enough to say, this guy must know what he's doing. He's yeah. considered one of the best coaches in the league. I, I got to at least give him that. Like he must have a plan. That's why after games media, we ask those questions mm -hmm. because we're watching games the same way. And we're like, well, why didn't you do this? but I respect you enough not to say you're an idiot. I'd rather ask you to explain it to me. So maybe when you explain it, I can say, all right, that made sense. Oh, I understand the thinking. And sometimes the explanation you're like, no, I disagree with that. That's mm. a reality. But, you know, I, I, I think the man, just to finish it, him and his coaching staff have proven enough, I think, when it comes to development, culture, style, demands, what they know they can get out of players, standard of play. The Knicks are as healthy as they've been yeah. since the Ewing era and the Jeff Van Gundy and all that. 
They have not been this healthy since then. And all the old heads who love the 90s, this team is the most likable team, yeah. not since that 90s team. This is the most likable team since before my time. Those Walt Clyde Frazier teams, yeah. those fans love those teams. This team is getting that kind of love from the fan base, and the coaching staff is a big part of it. He, he's brought him back. Absolutely brought him back. Salute to everybody in the chat. Once again, hit that thumbs up button for you boys. Del Will in the chat says, White Shadow was fire. There, there you go. So, <laughs> so you got fans here. Darlene Bryant, I loved White Shadow. Okay. Okay. See, I, I play an old man on the show oh, here, Alan, so I, I wasn't <laughs> familiar with it. You know, I clown on Alex, my co-host, because he's always dropping the Dragon Ball Z stuff. I'm like, you know, that was that was way after me, man. But, you know, you, you got me on that one. White Shadow. All right, so I got to check it out. Uh, yeah, check it out, check man. It out, man. It's, it's, it'll change your life. The 70s were a different time. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> on the ground, Crypto. So to you, this is live. We are live on YouTube. Looks like we got YouTube back. There was a little bit of a glitch in the matrix, but seems like YouTube is, is back on track. So uh, hit the like button, hit the share button, subscribe to the channel. Okay, Kareem the Dream. Go ahead and unmute your mic. Kareem the Dream. Kareem the Dream. Going once. Oh, he's a channel member. He wanted to get in uh, with Han, but doesn't look like he's ready. All right, so Kareem the Dream, we will drop you off. Let's hear from Femi. Femi from BK. Go ahead and unmute your mic. Femi, Femi going once. All right, Femi, I see that you did unmute your mic, but I'm getting no audio. So drop out of the Discord and jump back in, and we should get you working. Carlo from the Philippines. Carlo, go ahead and unmute your mic. Hey, kumusta kayo, CP and Alan? Carlo, how you doing, man? Carlo, I got your merch order, man. We're sending merch all the way to yeah, the Philippines, yeah. but man. But I'm still waiting for it. Let's all go. Right. You just ordered it on Saturday, man. We're, we're, not, we're not that Overnight nice. delivery, CP. What do you Let's think? Go. We put it on the Concord? <laughs> Salute, man. Can't wait to see it. Yeah. yeah First yeah. of all, Alan, sir, I'm a top fan uh, in your Facebook, and thank you for liking some of my comments in your post. Uh, oh, I personally, uh, I, I want Miami in the first round. Mm. Uh, it's just common knowledge based on basketball history, how we hated that team. But in reality, we have a better chance with the Sixers. But my question for you guys, uh, if we ever face Miami, do you think we can handle the physicality of the Heat? Uh, just uh, Adibayo yes. is just a menace in, play, uh, in mm -hmm. playing dirty. Uh, have you seen the Heat-Raptors game? Where Adibayo ran over IQ and hit him in the ribs with his knee. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. just an example it's, because it's mo so most of us are dreading that Mitch and I Heart and OG might aggravate those pre previous injuries if, if we play them. But but my game plan is uh, fight fire with fire with Miami. Mm. We can match the physicality. You know, uh, I need to see a Chua clothesline, Adebayo right from the tip off, <laughs> uh, stunt on bomb by Debo to Jaime Hakes. <laughs> but kidding aside, it's it. you uh, know, sweet revenge. You know, like the Rangers just Miami send out all the, the goons yeah. and the stuff at the, the first face off. Oh, I love that. Sort of line brawl I right out of the gate. Yeah, like, just set the tone. I, I absolutely love that, man. Do, do you buy the the Bam is a dirty player stuff? You, you buying that? I, th I think he's one of those guys. We've all played with one of those guys. We had a guy way back in the day, all right, he, he'd come into the gym. Like, we would have, like, his off season, right? So some of the guys would play, but you'd also get these other dudes that would come in that were good enough to play in your run, right? We had this one dude. He had a high motor, just never stopped running. His name was, was Mitch, right? Mm -hmm. And we used to call him Mitch Blood Green <laughs> because and Mitch, that, that was a boxer. Right? Yeah, Mitch Green, Mitch Green. But – yeah, we call him Mitch Blood Green because you drew blood every time. Like, he's the type of dude that in open gym, like, you'd be on a break. And, you know, you know how guys just back off, right? It's just got to take the – now, he'd run under you, mm. right? He'd run under you. Like, he would do those kind of things. And so it was always like you just knew, like, something bad was going to happen. Like, I think – and, and he didn't mean it. Like, mm. he just was playing hard. And I think, I think Bam is a guy that is, like, unintentionally – uh he, he reckless at times because we all know what happened last year with randall right now this year it was more uh ha um, Hawkes. um yeah Hawkes, yeah right with the, that took the, the, the unnecessarily took the charge mm -hmm. but bam just gets in those situations like like my fear is you know a box out situation and bam's got og in an arm bar and suddenly the elbow just mm. snaps yeah right? You're like yeah oh, man like seriously yeah but 
you know, but he's, he's look, he's got to acknowledge he's a great player. He plays hard. Yeah. But that's what I mean about series like that. I, I don't need Brunson driving to the basket or taking a three and landing on, you know, somebody's foot. And now it's like, what? Cause you had a careless closeout. But that's what they do. That's how they play that. Yeah. They, that's, you know, when they talk about heat culture, you know, the heat culture is also the old Pat Riley it's way. Old, which yeah. is hit, hit them high, hit them low. They're only going to call one foul. By right. any means high, necessary. They're only going to call one foul. By any That's means right. necessary. That's right. I, I think the Knicks are certainly yeah. absolutely, they can absolutely handle the physicality of the Heat, where I think the Heat oh, will, yeah. will yeah. give them the problems, especially on the defensive side. Their paint protection has always been on point, and Bam is right. a big part they of that. They better hit threes. They're yeah. versatile. They're switchable. They have a lot of, mm-hmm. you know, they don't, their size is like sneaky, right? Because like they don't have like the the, the big big forces in the in the paint, but their no, guards not a lot of length, are, right? They don't have length. Yes, but their that's guards where they are have their big. length, They're, right? That's, yeah, that's their length. Their length is in their guards. You know, Caleb Martin is great as far as chase down stuff and just you know where you didn't see him, there right. he is. Um, you know, Kevin Love is just reads the ball so well off the backboard, and he'll have those occasional pockets of a game where he'll hit a three, yeah. he'll throw an outlet pass for a, a quick you know, momentum changing layup, like little stuff like that about them. And then of course, Spo. Spo is just a brilliant coach. So, you know, I, like I said, I'd rather the Celtics have to put up with that headache. Yeah. Yeah. I'd rather that. Yeah. Than, and, and let the Knicks be the team that scratches and claws against a Sixers team to test them and see if they've got the medal to play that hard. Yeah. You know, like the, the Knicks are a tough team to put away because they just never stop coming at you. And I'd rather play a team that let me see if they've got that in them versus a heat team. I know they got that in them. True. And I'd rather them take a little piece out of the South. That's, that's why I'd, if you're asking me my, what I'd prefer to pick your poison, you know, the poison yeah. I would take would be the six. Yeah. I, I remember, I think it was game one last year, Nick's heat series. And I was at the garden and, and Kevin Love must've hit Jimmy uh, Butler with like four touchdown oh passes. I was like, when yeah. is it going to end? Yeah. You know, so the, yeah, they, they're just, sneaky in that it way. Sucks man. the life out of you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, mm-hmm. All right, do we have Kareem J- the Dream on the Discord? Kareem the Dream, go ahead and unmute your mic. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear, sir. How you feeling? Franchise channel member, welcome, man. man. I'm a techie too, so I was real there disappointed. I was pressing the button. Yeah, the I Discord. The Discord can be like yes. Nintendo sometimes. Sometimes you just gotta reset. You know, take the cartridge out. Or, you know, you gotta do your thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm a big fan, Alan Hahn. Thank you for, for doing the work in the dark days. Um, I know it hasn't always been fun. <laughs> oh, but yeah. um, I want you all to settle a debate for me, with me and my, my NBA friends, because if we go back to the whole Giannis speech about having a season be a failure, I think even when I listen to CP, the franchi- franchise, when, I'm, mm-hmm. when he's talking about if we go against the Miami Heat, we go, you know, banging with them in the first round. We're not, we're not scared, right? Yeah. I think when we're looking at the season as a success or a failure, would it be more of a success going seven games against the Heat and going out in a blaze of glory in the first round or getting banged up by the Pacers and then not having a competitive second round series? I believe that if we go against the Heat or the Sixers and beat them, and lose in the second round, it's a much better season than if we beat the Pacers mm. and, and fizzle out. What do you all think? I actually feel like getting through this first round, not to say any series is easier, I feel like this first round matchup is going to be the toughest one they have to face before getting to a potential Eastern Conference Finals. What do you think? That's correct. Yeah, that's that. That's correct. Is that, to me, the scary part of what if you survive the first first round and go into the second round the scary part of that is then the letdown you know because you know you come out of a fight like right. whatever they're going to come out of in the first round and then you walk into something that won't be the same type of physicality and be a little more of like again if it's in indiana it's just the up and down high flying can you keep up with our offense type of uh, deal and i don't know if they can and so you know it, it takes me back to like 99 99 they they had to claw scratch and fight through a five game just absolute brawl and you know Allen Houston shot and suddenly they're just like oh crap we won right yeah, you know what I mean yeah, like, yeah. like and their your next opponent was the Atlanta Hawks the Atlanta Hawks was just like they didn't see they had no idea what was coming that team came out of that series 
instead of exhaling, it was almost like, oh, we got this. Yeah, you know, yeah. We beat them. Like, they're out of the way now. And that team just seemed to, like, raise their level off that Heat series and brought them all the way, you know, to, you know, just – I like, that Atlanta series was a blur. Yeah. It was can be Duncan down the down the floor, and it's not. <laughs> I don't remember anything else. Yeah, like honestly, that, that's how they made quick that work out of the Ben. Quick work. So, it's that's what I'd want to see is would the Knicks come out of this series and exhale, and then you get you know get punched in the mouth in mm. game one, and you go oh, crap. That's right. Like this team likes to run, and we gotta you know it, like that's what you can't have happen. And so I'd need to see that. Like, what does it look like? Because that could be. A season could still be disappointing if you get out of that first round and then losing the second round to that team. That's right. Because that would tell you, like last year, there was no there was no indignity to losing to the Heat. It was a yeah. six game series. It was a it was tough, physical. You you know your best player got hurt again. All that stuff that happened. Jalen was this close to forcing a game seven. You know there was some dignity to that. I don't know if I'd feel the same way if. Boy, all you had to do was beat a Pacer team that has no playoff experience right. to get to the conference finals. And if you can't do that, then there'd be this feeling of that was a letdown. My opinion. All right, yeah, great. thanks for thanks for answering. Appreciate yeah. it, man. Appreciate y'all. Yeah, man. Call call back anytime. That's Kareem, the Dream Franchise channel member. We're going to load up Ace in the Discord uh, before we wrap. I also want to shout out Afrique NY Franchise channel member. $10 Super Chat says Mr. Afrique NY and Mrs. C. Gurley are huge fans of Alan Hahn and CP the Franchise. We never miss an episode and listen on the radio driving to and from work. NY Radio and YouTube is back. Okay, salute to Afrique NY. De- definitely salute that. there. Thank you. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Wait a second here. Oh, Han, this is, this is the first time you're experiencing this. We have another super chat. Can you take a guess who it's from? It is from none other than Mr. Friday Night Knicks. Robert Randolph with a $20 super chat. Sergeant Sources, as we call him on this show, our resident insider <laughs> who's never broken a trade, says, spoke to a Miami player. They are confident they will beat the Knicks in the series. Says we only have one ball creator score and they will shut us down. Okay. There we go. Robert Randolph, ladies and gentlemen. Sergeant Sources is here with us. And uh, just gave us some intel. Take it for what it's worth. Shout out to Robert. I heard last year. I could share this last year. um, Right before the Heat series. No, no, it was actually when they hit the playoff after they won the play-in, right? Said to a friend of mine uh, about the Knicks, oh, we're coming for y'all, is how Jimmy said it. Mm. Like, And it was like this, like, you know, maniacal, typical maniacal Jimmy Butler. Like, you know, you had a nice season, but we're coming for y'all. And, and I know my friend was just like, I didn't like hearing that. Mm. I didn't like hearing that. I was like, man, you know, that's just that. So... I'm curious if uh, if Jimmy still has that kind of energy this year, but you know we we'll yeah. see. Uh, yeah. It's going to be a fun game to watch tomorrow, that's for sure. Yeah, no, no that's question be about a fun it. Fun game to watch. Well, I think judging off of Robert's track record, I think I like our chances if we do get Miami. So if it's Knicks Miami at six o'clock, he says Miami's confident they will beat the Knicks. I think I go Knicks in five, man. So appreciate Robert for his <laughs> contributions here. Sergeant Sources, call back anytime. Just keep making great music, keep baby. Making Don't great worry about music, the man. Just keep, keep making keep great making music. Great That's music. all. All right, Ace, go ahead and, and close us out, man. Ace on the Discord. BP, how you doing? Good, man. How you doing, man? I'm doing good, man. Uh, I'm feeling good with the playoffs. I'm very proud of the New York Knicks. Uh, Jalen Brunson, the true MVP, empowering his team to the number two seed facing so many injuries this season overcoming all odds like always but i want to talk about the playoffs man um Uh really boston i'm worried about boston just simply off the talent factor but the boston celtics have no heart they have no energy Uh they have no soul or identity uh in that team i would compare it to something almost like the bull and the matador right Uh against boston celtics we would have to be the bull because we would have to go out there and attack them um, they're ready to be on the back foot. Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown, they don't really they don't really give me that chippy vibe. 
Miami, I feel like we'd have to be more the Matador. That would like CPU is talking about boxing, right? The Knicks versus Miami is very um comparable to Gennady Golovkin versus Canelo Alvarez, right? Two guys mm-hmm. with extreme power and um very technical fighters, so to say. The Celtics all compared them to like um Antonio uh, uh Antonio Barrera mm-hmm. versus Prince Nassim Hamed. You know, mm-hmm. so you always got to think about matchups mm-hmm. and uh, try to translate that and see that in a different perspective that could translate um, from other sports and how you can engage those scenarios psychologically, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, the, you know, the Celtics have to exercise those demons. They, they've they've come yep. close several times. They should have won the championship a couple of years ago. And it's I think it's, it's going to still be up to Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum. And... You know, yep. I, I've talked about this a few times in terms of where they were, where they stay in history in terms of their net rating and their point differential, and the company that they are around. I mean, those are historic teams: seventy-two right. and ten Bulls, the 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 Warriors team that beat that record. I just don't think yep. the Celtics are that team. <laughs> it's no, uh, and it's very interesting. Not at all. Yeah, yeah. And people people fail to like, um, people fail to know Jason Tatum has been gifted. With amazing teammates, who do you have? Terry Rozier, yeah. Gordon Hayward, Marcus Smart, um, Ma- uh, Malcolm Brogdon. Yeah. Jason Tatum has had a plethora of dudes. You put Luka Doncic drafted in the same situation Jason Tatum was drafted in. Luka Doncic has a, a chip maybe too. Mm. What, what do you think so, about that, Han? You, you think so? And pre- appreciate the call, man. Ace. This is the best. This is the best roster he's had. This is the best roster Tatum's had yeah. right now. This team. This is the best team he's had. You know. I mean, is he trying to tell me that the Celtics are Deontay Wilder right? when it comes down to crunch time? When it <laughs> to comes this down, day, right? In yeah, the big, to this day, right? In the big fight, yeah. You know, yeah. can, can he can he throw the big punch? Can he get the knockout, or is he going to fade uh, in the biggest fight? Right? Isn't that what kind of what happens there? So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, we don't know what we know. Celtics, what is their if they if there's a knock on them? It's number one, the coach is never going to be the smartest coach in the series. Look at the East. I mean, there's only one coach I would take, um, I would take him over, and that's Bickerstaff mm-hmm. at the Cats. I don't think Bickerstaff is a good coach. Mm-hmm. So, Missoula is incredibly inexperienced, very slow when it comes to figuring out what to do with his team, and they don't really respond much to him. But they're so good that, you know, you can see that. They just they have their talent, they have their system, and it works. But in game, yeah, you know he's he's going to get out coached. He sees things really late. Um, they also don't close well. They don't. And I, I I talked about that one time with somebody in Boston there, and they started throwing at me, you know, the analytics. Oh, what their clutch numbers? Look at their clutch record. And stop with that. Don't give me that because a lot of times they were in a clutch situation because they blew a lead. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah, clutches, yeah. Five minutes to go, five yeah, points or five fewer. Points. Well, in that game, they were probably up by 15, 20. Right. And somehow, some way, it got the five points with five minutes to go, and they held on to win. So don't give me that. I think, I've think i seen them blow leads. I've seen them have a hard time. The phrase I always use is they play with their food. Last year in the playoffs, they did that with Atlanta. They yeah, did it with yeah, the Sixers. Yeah. And then they went down 3-0 to and Miami, they, yeah. tried to force – you know, they did force a game seven, but it was too little too late. That's all. If you are trying to get at them in a playoff series, you have to rely on those things. I'll coach them and keep punching to see if they'll just keep mm. retreating. And then maybe, just maybe, you get them to stagger enough that they'll just give up. They'll, they'll the knockout punch, you know, Mortal Kombat, finish him. That's, that's how I see the Celtics. But they are a juggernaut. They are, to me, by far the best team in the East, yeah. and it's going to take everything to beat them in a seven-game series. No, they are not a team to, to take lightly at all. No, no at question. All. That's about a great it, team. And let's see if our guy Kristaps Porzingis. I, I think he could swing things for them, man. Just the way that they use him, he's dangerous. Yeah. They're, they're dangerous. Hard to guard him. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Drew Holiday yeah. as well. Yeah, so no, no, they. Yeah, well, that, those two pieces were so. Here's something funny. Yeah. Imagine if the Heat were able to get Dame Lillard like they wanted. Mm. Think about this landscape of the East. The Heat get Dame Lillard. That means Drew Holiday doesn't leave Milwaukee. Right. Stays there. The Celtics don't get him. 
they keep Brogdon instead. Like, how much different is everybody in that <laughs> yeah. scenario? Yeah. Right? You're right. You're right. Like, it's just amazing how the decision to go to Milwaukee rather than Miami, like, how impactful, you know, that is. Yeah. So, true so story. I guess the player, it's, it's the Boston Invitational, and whoever gets to the conference final, you got to stay healthy go. enough to give them every punch you got and see if you can take them out. Let's go. That's really what the East is going to be. It's well, be when, fun. when they get to the conference finals, they got to see Brunson. They got to see OG and probably Dante's Inferno and the gang, man. Let's go, Knicks. Six o'clock <laughs> Saturday, ladies and gentlemen. We will be there in the building. Han Solo will be there. I will be there. Let's go, Knicks, man. We are ready to go. We will be locked in on the play in tomorrow, 7.30 p.m. Uh, join us on the NBA Report. JD Sports Talk will be calling the game play-by-play -play live. We'll be tapped in for every second second and then we will uh, also react to it man also remember that our game one giveaway is currently active go to underdog fantasy right now and use our code kftv for your chance to win two tickets to game one it is a hot ticket a lot of people are complaining they can't get access so we are giving you that access two tickets to the game go to underdogfantasy.com and use our code kftv to sign up uh, Solo, thanks again for the time, man. As you said, it's a busy time, so we definitely appreciate you for tapping in. We had to get it in today. And uh, yeah, man, I, I appreciate all the time. And if you need me, if you need a tag team partner, man, let me tell you something. I've been following this feud with you and the Nature Boy, Ric Flair. I'm here for it. I got the popcorn ready. But if I got to catch somebody with a knife edge chop in your name, just let me know, man. Just let me know. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. No, we got to build up. We got to build it up. We got to build up my corner just in case, just in case I, you know, he keeps acting up. He told me he's going to come at me now because LeBron just won. And so the oh, yeah. Lakers did win that game. And now they're going to be a playoffs. And he said, you're going to hear from me. I said, oh, here we go. So I got to see what he's going to do on social media next. But he knows, he knows yeah. not the best. He knows he's going to get the clap back. That, that that is hilarious man we'll, we'll be tapped in thanks again everybody from at home thanks again for tuning in remember that this show is available in audio podcast format and we'll see you guys uh tomorrow play by play live sixers versus heat franchise and solo we out of here peace